you're watching Vini TV, a wine program packed with broken English and passion for wine. And now we are in Farang in Helsinki and we have a lovely guest, Camille Seghesio from Seghesio Family Vineyards from California. Why don't you tell the wine freaks out there who you are and what you do? My name is Camille Segesio. Uh, I am third generation, so my grandparents started um, Segesio Family Vineyards in 1895. For the new world, that is quite a long time. We are over 100 years old. Uh, we are working with the first varieties my grandparents planted in 1895, Zinfandel, Italian varietals. It's a very passionate, intense Italian-American family. We love to grow grapes, we love to make wine, and we love to eat Italian food. Excellent. And she's the first guest to ever grab the mic. I really like her <laughs> initiative. Uh, so you have a really, really long history. You go back to 1800s, I think. And how would you see, like, from the 1800s, how has Sekhes, your family vineyards, changed over the years? I can hold it. So. Okay. So when my grandparents arrived to America, it yeah. was a very different place than it, than it is today. So it, California was filled with immigrants, lots of European immigrants. They dreamed of finding gold. They didn't find gold. They had to find employment. So they brought the traditions of grape growing and winemaking to California. Sure. Then Prohibition came. Then World War I. Then the crash on Wall Street. Then World War II. So very difficult times from 1919 up until World War II. So today, it's a very different environment. We don't have so many Italian-Americans. Uh, the wine culture is something that has started fairly recently in the United States. But one thing that is true is that people are very much enjoying wine and food with the family and the friends. So that part is the same. Okay. So we're actually tasting now champagne, and you're not that very well known for growing uh, champagne and doing champagne, but you're actually very famous for your Sinfandel. And Sinfandel overall in California is quite famous. But how would you characterize, because I think there might be some people that don't really know the characteristics of uh, Zinfandel wine. How would you characterize your wines? So Zinfandel, like my grandparents who were immigrants from e Europe and came and became something quite extraordinary in the New World, Zinfandel has its origins in Croatia. It's a Croatian grape. It was not so interesting in, in, in Europe at that time. It made its way to United States and in 1852 entered California and took off, became very popular. Many of the reasons that it was popular in the 1880s and 1890s are still true today. It's a softer tannin wine. It's not so tannic that you need to wait 10 to 15 years before you drink it. It is sweet, but not sweet from residual sugar. So it's sweet, ripe fruit, blackberry, raspberry, uh, blueberry, cherry, spice. It's very good with many different types of cuisine. And so it's the sweetness, even though the wine is fermented dry, that makes it pairing very well with lots of different types of food. Okay, and how do you really because I, I, I think many people in Finland hasn't really had the opportunity to taste the high quality Sinfandel. How do you guarantee the, uh, the quality? How, what do you do in the vineyards, in the winery that makes them so famous? This is an excellent question. So the truth is, is that Zinfandel is a very difficult grape. It's a difficult grape because it ripens unevenly. Mm -hmm. Every single Zinfandel planted anywhere in the world, young vine, will ripen very unevenly. So if you're not doing things in the vineyard to challenge this, you're not going to have a very good wine. That's why much Zinfandel that is produced is not the same quality depending on what the winery is doing in the vineyards. So we drop by hand all the fruit that is ripening too fast or too slow. So at Segesio, because we are 100% estate, we farm everything by hand, we own all of our own vineyards, and we drop every year between 30 to 40% of our entire crop. And that's the guarantee that from us, you're only going to get a wine that is balanced, that is low yield, and that doesn't have the underripe fruit or the overripe fruit. That's why you don't see so many Zinfandel specialists internationally that are exporting their wines, but there are some wonderful Zinfandels made. It's just that you have to be committed in the vineyards to dropping the fruit to make a very, very good Good Zinfandel. So it, it, it's it's because of the the vigorous nature of, of the vine, or is it is it the the unripening inside the berry or inside the vineyard, or it's how it happens? Uneven ripening in the same cluster. So the same cluster at say 50% verasion will have some some green underripe berries and some overripe raisins, and then the good bit, the ripe bit in the middle, which is this purple fruit, which is the blackberry, the blueberry, the cherry. So what most wineries can do is they wait until the whole thing is ripe. 
at which point you have some overripe fruit. And these raisins will make the wine um, more alcoholic, um, can be uh, more powerful and overripe. So what we do is we go in and we drop the fruit that is underripe and the fruit that is overripe. Yeah. So this is a very, you have to do it by hand. Um, it's very labor intensive, it's very expensive, but you get, the better, you get a better result in the wine. And the key is the balance. Um, you know, Zinfandel can be underripe, it can be overripe, but it's beautiful when it's morphologically ripe in the middle without these green berries and without the raisins. I was actually talking with some people in Twitter about uh, Zinfandel and do people like them or not. And people tend to like them, except white Zinfandel. What's your take on white Zinfandel? Actually, Tim Atkin asked this question. What is your take on uh, white Zinfandel? So the truth is, white Zinfandel, we used to make white Zinfandel in the old days. And the truth is, a dry white Zinfandel is not so different than the lovely rosé you have when you're in the south of France in the summer. The problem is, white Zinfandel was sweet, so everybody was completely anti-white Zinfandel. So I would say that um, when it's dry, it's lovely. I agree that I don't particularly care for it when it's sweet. But the truth is, white Zinfandel kept many vines planted. So white Zinfandel allowed many grape growers to survive. So even though the entire wine world is anti-white Zinfandel, the truth is, if you were a grower that planted Zinfandel in 1910 and Prohibition came, you were happy when white Zinfandel came because they paid you a little bit more for the grapes, and that allowed you to keep them you know, planted. And it's worth noting that Zinfandel in California these are among the oldest vines, even on a global level. These are planted on St. George rootstock. This is the same rootstock the Europeans used to replant when their vineyards were lost to phylloxera. So we have vines that are over 100 years old. They give us about one ton per acre. So, of course, they had to pass through white Zinfandel, but today those vines are giving us beautiful old vines in fruit, and this is the signature grape of Sonoma County. It's the highest price per ton paid. I mean, Napa Cabernet sets the market in Napa, sure. but in Sonoma County, it's Old Vines Zinfandel. So that was a long answer, but that's how <laughs> I feel about White Zinfandel. Excellent. So we are actually now in, in Helsinki in this cool restaurant called Farang. And what, how, do you like Helsinki? It's, it's raining now like sideways. What's the, your favorite thing about Finland or Helsinki in general? So I love three things uh, about Finland. Uh, number one, I love Itala. Uh, number two, uh, I love the way that... Um, you, you have a very, your society is, is quite different than we have in the States. And I like very much that it's, it's quite cohesive. You have, you, ha, you have wonderful things here that are different from what we have, but in a way it's like a small family. Uh, and I'm very excited about this evening because this is the first winemaker dinner I have done with Asian cuisine. So I'm very much hoping that I am so inspired by tonight that the next time I go back to Asia, I'm taking this idea of Asian cuisine with our wines. Hope so. Do you have any message that you would like to send to the viewers of Vini TV about wine, life, whatever? Yes. Uh, no country has a monopoly on terroir. No country has a monopoly on, on great wine. Great wine is born and it's produced and it's crafted by passionate people all over the world. And so if you're making Malbec in Argentina, if you're making Pinot Noir in Burgundy, or you're making Old Vine Zinfandel in California, you, you, ha you are united in the common goal of giving giving someone a, a noble wine that you would have at your dining room table. And that's what I would say to everyone. Except message. We will stay here, continue drinking champagne and good Zinfandels later with Asian cuisine. So until next time, cheers. Chin chin.